Okay, Good so wel welcome everyone to our monthly opportunities and health IT session. I'm Charlene Banta. I'm the program director of the health IT program at St. John's River State College here in St. Augustine. We're pleased to partner with the Northeast Florida Health Information Management Association to offer these monthly lunch and learn sessions that feature the stories of health IT and health information management professionals. So a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started. Everyone on the call um, should stay muted. Uh, feel free to enter questions for our speaker in the chat box. There is one continuing education unit granted for attendance and the process for claiming that will be shared at the end. Um, and also the session is being recorded. So today our speaker is Julia McCurry. Uh, she serves as a manager in health information management, as well as a program director at the Mayo Clinic School of Health Sciences. She's also the president of our Northeast Florida Health Information Management Association. So Julia, we really appreciate you being with us today uh, to share your story. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to share some information about different opportunities in health information technology. Um, I'll get started with a little bit about me. Um, I actually received my education at St. John's River State College. Um, I had an associate in arts and business. Back then, we did not have a health information program, and I wasn't sure what else I wanted to do. So um, as you can see, it took me a long time to do that AA degree. They say uh, usually you can do an associate's in what, four, um, eight terms? Um, I like to say I completed my AA in only three terms as an overachiever, and those three terms would be the presidential terms of Reagan, Bush, and Clinton. So um, at the time, you know, when we're busy working and we're raising a family, it's hard to get it done. But um, I did go back to St. John's again when they started offering a health inf information management and received my associate in science degree as well as um, completed my RHIT certification. And then just a few years ago, I went back to um, get my bachelor's degree. Um, University of Cincinnati Online had a great RHIT to RHIA conversion program. Um, and currently I am in um, the FSU College of Law getting a Juris Master's degree in healthcare regulation. So one year almost down and one more year to go. Um, my credentials, I do hold currently an RHIA now um, through AHIMA, as well as the Certified Healthcare Technology Specialist for Implementation Support, which has been sunset, um, but it is still a, a AHIMA credential. Um, my career path has taken many twists and turns, as you might have seen from the jagged path. Um, in my introductory slide. So I started out in fall of 1985 on a clinical rotation, that PPE that's so important for students. Um, I did mine at Orange Park Medical Center and went through various departments, not just HIM, but also the lab and um, administrative areas and the ED and anywhere that they needed um, some help. Um, so in February 1986, while I was still doing my rotations, um, the lab actually hired me as a lab assistant and receptionist. So I did equipment cleaning of all of their glassware, beakers. I did the uh, preventive maintenance tests of eye wash stations. I was filing. I was helping patients at the reception area. Um, they figured out I knew how to type, so they had me typing all their policies and procedures and anything that they needed. Um, I was always willing to learn anything new they had for me. Always say yes and make yourself indisposable. Um, in 1988, I was promoted to a transcriptionist for lab and pathology. And then I also learned to assist the pathology techs um, for doing things that we call uh, frozen sections. The pathologist has to go to the OR, um, take a sample. We would prepare a slide for him to read to give an instant diagnosis. And I also assisted the point of care coordinator. So we had, for example, glucose testing meters that were up on the floor. 
so I kind of coordinated the QA for all of those glucose meters and did spreadsheets on any time a result came back that was too high or too low for the blood sugar, was a follow-up test done, and was the appropriate action taken. Um, in 1992, I was promoted to um, an administrative assistant in the C-suite. So the CEO, the COO, and the CFO were all um, in my area. So I took messages and did clerical work for them as well as taking minutes for all of our medical staff department meetings and doing all of the quality statistics and reporting. Um, in 1993, we kind of had a reorganization and my duties then fell under quality and utilization management combined with the medical library and medical staff office. So then I started learning the credentialing and national practitioner database and a lot of other things in that role. Um, in 1995, I transferred to what was then medical records uh, simply for the opportunity um, to go back to my transcription roots and be able to work from home. Kids were little at the time in elementary school. It was nice to see them walk down the street, get on the bus. I could work all day. And then as they were getting off the school bus and walking back in the door, I was done. So um, I worked my way to become the backup to our lead transcriptionist and started doing the training, um, the QA for our transcription group. Uh, 2012, um, our transcription area was outsourced to a, another vendor. So I was able to transfer to cardiology and do their ancillary transcription and scheduling, um, things that couldn't be outsourced. So sometimes your best laid plans, you think you're going to be in HIM forever and you're thrown a curveball. So when that happens, Number one, if you have made yourself indisposable and you know a lot of other different things um, that can open doors for you, um, working with our card cardiology colleagues, they uh, uh, um, immediately reached out and said, hey, we've got an opening over here. So instead of taking the offer with the outsourced transcription company, I just transferred to cardiology and started learning the, the scheduling side of our operations, as well as doing all of their cardiology transcription. Um, in 2014, that position was eliminated. Um, I indicate that it was devastating. I thought, I've worked so hard all of these years, always saying yes to any project they gave me, doing everything I could to happen um, to help my organization. Um, but then weeks later, the lab manager called me and said, hey, I heard you got laid off. Are you looking for work? Because I've got a part-time position open as a pathology tech. And she remembered the days that I used to help the pathology techs. I used to go do those frozen sections in the OR with the pathologist. I knew their accessioning system. Um, and of course, I said, yes, I will sweep the floors if you would like me to. Um, and I really enjoyed being back in pathology and being in the operating room um, during the surgeries. Um, in 2014, around that same time, I was working part-time, so I was also volunteering uh, for NEFEMA, helping with their spring seminar. I was the recording secretary. Um, I was also on a couple of our committees, and I was the webmaster, so I was helping um, post all the latest information on our internet site. One day, I got um, something from Nita Thompson asking me to please post this job opening at Mayo Clinic on our website. And after I posted it, I actually applied for it. Um, and I say it was really meant to be when I went for my interview at Mayo Clinic. Um, the person who interviewed me actually remembered at the spring seminar that Nita Thompson took the time to thank me for all of my hard work in um, everything I did to make that event successful. So. Again, the more you help others, the more you say yes to projects, you get your name out there, you get people to know how valuable you can be, that really does help you. Um, in 2015, just a year later, I was already serving as the subject matter expert for Mayo Clinic's new EPIC electronic health record. We call it the Mayo Plumber Chart. 
and it required frequent travel for convergence. We had to find out how is Arizona doing things, how is Minnesota, um, our health system in Wisconsin, as well as Rochester, which we call our mothership. So I served on projects um, from 2015 all the way to the present, um, transitioning from site-based teams to role-based teams. So instead of having a group in Florida, for example, that does something and a group in Arizona that does something, it's really one group. The assistant supervisor can be at any Mayo Clinic site. The supervisor can be at any other different Mayo Clinic site. And then your team members are spread out through what we call the enterprise. And they're not really face-to-face um, -face with you every day. Um, we've been very successful in using technology to create very successful role-based teams. Um, in 2018, I was named the founding secretary for the medical record review subgroup, um, also serving as supervisor for the record review team. Um, and last year in 2019, I was promoted to the HIMS manager. So I now have 50 employees from all different areas, even some states where Mayo Clinic does not have a presence, because 90% of my staff are now teleworkers. So there's a remote leadership component. Um, it includes the 50 employees, three supervisors, and four assistant supervisors in all of those states you see, plus others. I am responsible for department operations in the emergency department analysis, um, inpatient and observation analysis team, the hospital outpatient and OP surgery analysis, concurrent analysis, and the record review teams. So we have to assure on a daily basis the balance of our staffing levels to our workload, the quality of the data, and that our timeliness is maintained. So we have to maintain an in-depth knowledge of external regulatory requirements and internal policies. Um, and then I serve on the command center team for joint commission, CMS, and other surveys. It's very important for joint commission that if you have an internal policy, that you are following your internal policy, even if it is not a regulatory requirement. For example, if you have the um, Joint Commission policy that an H&P should be done within 24 hours, but your organization strongly feels they would like H&Ps done within four hours of admission, you can create that internal policy for your organization stating it must be done in four hours. However, if Joint Commission comes in and does an audit, if they find one that was done, say, six hours after admission, they can cite you for being out of compliance with your own policy, even though their requirement is still 24 hours. And along with that, I serve on various institutional committees. It's always good for HIMS to have a seat at the table whenever there are discussions that involve um, different departments or groups. So we have different work groups that meet monthly that we're actively involved in our EHR design and build or any workflow processes that come up. Um, working with physician practice groups for improvements to documentation, and we always call them best practices, and to facilitate any change request projects. Uh, the qualifications for my current role is a minimum of a bachelor's degree in health information organizational leadership, business, or a related field with five years of related management or supervisory experience, and it does require either an RHIT or RHIA. Um, preferred qualifications are a master's degree with one to three years of relevant management experience. Um, at Mayo Clinic, they prefer the Mayo Quality Academy certification or equivalent, and any applicable AHIMA, the HIMSS or the H AHDI credentials re related to your specific role. Um, so benefits of the role are the salary and benefits. Mayo Clinic has a self-insured health plan, which gives our employees access to the best providers in the world. So you can't beat that. Um, it came in very useful just six months after um, I started at Mayo Clinic. Um, 
our, our surgical team was able to save my husband's life and our oncology team has done the same since. So that's again why I believe it was really meant to be that in my previous role, my position was eliminated and as bad as it was at the time, and now I completely understand that that is exactly what had to happen um, for my husband to have the best care and uh, be doing as well as he is today. So um, travel, for those who like travel, that's certainly a, a opportunity. Um, we have site visits and in-person leadership meetings that is on hold right now due to COVID, but um, that's an important part of the remote leadership. Occasionally it does require a face-to-face -face visit. And the variety of tasks, it is truly never the same day twice. You might think you know what your plan is for today and what you need to do, but there are always things that come up that are urgent that you have to switch gears and take care of. So you have to be flexible. Um, there is a constantly changing environment with regulations, with our technology, uh, staffing issues, updated policies, and then of course, uh, physician feedback and making sure that we're responding to them and being able to support what they need for their documentation. Our data results frequently create new opportunities. If we identify that we have a trend or an opportunity to improve in a certain area, then what do we need to do to facilitate that improvement? Um, is it a project? Is it working with a new group? Is it reaching out to resources that you haven't used in the past? But there are always new opportunities to reach out and be able to um, affect some change. And then, of course, those urgent issues that might interrupt your plans for the day. Lately, we have been sending a lot of people to work from home that have never worked from home before. Challenges of, of the role are definitely solving technology issues. Um, our Mayo plumber chart, as we call it, um, is based on the EPIC Foundation system, which we have highly customized to Mayo Clinic's needs. Um, there's always the practice or the physician groups um, buying in for changes that affect their workflows. They do count clicks, so sometimes they will ask what the impact is going to be on their clerical burden. They frequently understand if you can explain why this change is needed and how it's going to benefit the patient. And then we have multiple support teams involved in change requests. So you might have to reach out to the anesthesia team and the ambulatory team and revenue cycle and many other teams and try to get representatives from each to um, really come to an agreement on how this can work. Um, the great thing is we have a great IT um, support staff and they help us a lot with solving our technology issues. Um, another challenge is crucial conversations and relationship building. So we have employee issues at different sites and you can't always have a face to face with that employee. We do use webcams and Skype and other technology to try to um, create where you're not just talking to a voice, that there's really somebody there and be able to have an honest, open conversation where we're supportive and trying to figure out how we can work on solving these issues together. Um, also partnerships with physicians and other teams to solve these problems and implement best practices that can be challenging at time, especially when different groups may not agree on the same solution. And another challenge is just time. We have many projects and tasks going on at once. Um, we have that wonderful technology um, so sometimes staff or colleagues might need your time. They might send you little Skype IM messages or urgent emails. And then of course we are in the meetings doing our collaboration. So sometimes there's, seems like we have a lot of meetings and I didn't get done what I really needed to get done today. But um, we, we prioritize like everyone else with your school projects and with your work deadlines. And we make sure that the priority things are taken care of and everything else we start fresh again tomorrow. So recommendations for people that are looking for um, opportunities in HIT. 
I always recommend continuing your further education and obtaining your AHIMA certifications that are most relevant to the work that you're interested in. Even though it may be a preferred qualification to have, say, um, a bachelor's degree or the RHIT, get that preferred qualification. That will make you stand out if you're applying for other people that have the same qualifications you currently have. It also shows that you're um, committed to the professional development. Um, get tech sa savvy. Add new applications and tools to your skill set. The more you know about technology, it's really um, critical in these days that we understand how the system works and why. Um, any training that you have on specific, say, Microsoft Visio, it's out there for everyone. Not everyone uses it. I don't use it that often myself, but it helps that if someone needs to present something in Visio or we need to edit a workflow and make some changes, that I can use that Visio tool to um, make those changes. Um, for new students that are just getting into healthcare, get your foot in the door anywhere you can, um, even if it's entry level, if it's a temporary position or limited tenure um, contract or in another department. Again, that helps us see you even if you're um, a temporary employee. We get to know you, we get to know your work, we get to know you're here every day on time, that you're eager to learn, that you're saying yes to tasks. That can really be a, a, a great thing when a full-time opening comes available. If you apply for it and the hiring managers already know you and know the quality of your work, that's going to be a great advantage to you. Um, we do have one of our senior specialists now who um, actually started in another department. We've actually got several, but um, she did a presentation for us last year where she described there were no openings in HIM. So um, she actually got um, a position in scheduling. And then she just reached out to the HIM leader um, over scanning and said, hey, um, I'm interested in seeing more about what you do. Is there any way that I could come over on my day off and just shadow your staff and learn a little bit more about your department? And when a position came open, that um, hiring manager remembered her and knew she had her RHIT and HIMSS is where she wanted to be and that she had um, taken that initiative. And she did end up getting hired and then eventually promoted within our department. So asking HIMSS leaders if you can shadow the roles if you really want. Um, if you're not in HIMSS or if you're in one area of HIMSS but you'd really like to learn, you think that um, deficiency analysis is very interesting, or maybe you're doing scanning and you w really like release of information. It doesn't hurt to ask if you can just shadow the roles on your own time. Um, help with any projects you can. It increases your own knowledge, plus it can establish you as an expert in specific areas. And volunteer. Um, networking and demonstrating your work ethic can lead to additional opportunities. And again, using myself as an example, when um, I did get laid off from my um, previous position, I had people from NEFEMA reaching out to me that worked at Baptist or worked at St. Vincent's or other facilities that said, hey, um, let me see what we've got open here. If there's not something in HIM, let me see what I have at my organization because they were like, maybe we can get you in, you know, your foot in the door at this facility until something opens up in HIMSS. So it really does, it pays off and it's a good way to give back. Um, I like to volunteer just because so many people have helped me along the way, then I just feel like it's my duty to give back and, and to help others in the same way. So are there any questions? I am not seeing any questions in the chat. Um, if you do have a question for Julia, feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself and you can ask verbally as well. Uh, Julia, good morning. This is Nadia Maddox. Um, just a quick question. 
as far as your educational background, um, with the, with the part that you're in now, as far as your mastering masters um, through the law, the law school. Mm -hmm. I, I never that even was... knew that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, come a part of it because when I saw the school, uh, whatever you had, what is it called? I'm sorry. The Juris Master's the, Program at FSU. Right. I didn't under I didn't realize that you could actually get a master's from a place like that. And you said basically it's to get um, the legalization, the different legal things tied to HSC stuff. Yes, I am in the healthcare regulation track. And that was another happy accident. Like most of my career, I just got my foot in the door and I did whatever I I was asked to do or whatever they needed me to. And sometimes I felt like my career led me. Um, I did not really have a, I want to do this and that's what I did. And the law degree is another great example of that. I was actually talking to a provider um, about something that we felt was a compliance risk. If Joint Commission was cited, we thought that this particular way he was documenting wasn't going to be sufficient. And he disagreed. And so we were just discussing this. Um, it does take a little bit of practice to work with a provider who's very busy and thinks maybe this is um, inconvenient and why are you bothering me about this? But as long as you're supportive and helpful, I was just trying to explain this is what our internal policy says versus what we're seeing in the documentation so we feel that we're at risk and I volunteered to share his feedback with our practice leadership group that I was a part of so that they could discuss it with the physicians present as well as our policy leads present and our regulatory staff present and I remember after that 45 minute phone call I told my boss, sometimes I think I need a law degree to do this job. And I meant it as a joke, but the more I thought about it, I was at the point where I was ready to go back for my master's. Um, and it just made sense that what is there in healthcare law? It really gave me an opportunity also because there was no one else in my department that had any sort of law degree. Um, we, we have a regulatory manager, um, but she has um, an HIM degree and not a specific law degree. So I thought, you know, one day if I were to move into the regulatory area, which has kind of become my expertise, that would be very helpful. So originally I was thinking if that regulatory manager ever retired, maybe that's the direction I want to go and a healthcare degree, um, well, a healthcare law degree might help. And uh, Lee Starling, who is our president of Fahima, uh, she actually was in the Juris Master's program at FSU at the time. Um, and yes, yeah, I just asked her questions about how it worked. And I thought law sounds like it could be incredibly boring at times. Are you able to learn or are there video lectures that put you to sleep? And all those sorts of questions and she was really enjoying the program she talked about how engaging it was and I after being in it a full year I have to agree anyone that's really thinking that healthcare law is an area you might want to uh, go in I would definitely check out um, the FSU program is a hundred percent online for the um, the Juris Masters program Wow that's phenomenal to hear thank you so much for sharing you're welcome. I really don't we think do. I could have done a master's in law otherwise if it wasn't online. We do have a question in the chat. Um, I've had issues with trying to shadow others. What's the best approach to finding people and places that will allow this? It might depend on your organization, but um, I would start out with your own um, direct supervisor and just let that person know, hey, I'm interested in, in professional development. I'd like to learn and grow. I'd like to see some other opportunities. Sometimes that person might be willing to reach out to their colleagues and say, hey, is it okay if my um, staff member um, shadows your staff member? Um, we've worked a lot of that out. But if your supervisor, for example, doesn't have the connections or sometimes they're they're busy and um, don't have the extra time to go seek out those opportunities for you, 
um, you could just ask your supervisor, is it okay if I reach out to, you know, say the ROI supervisor, for example, and ask her if I can just sit over there for a couple of hours one afternoon when I'm not working. So just asking is usually the first key and letting your uh, people you directly report to. Um, and if, if that's not successful, just asking for permission, like I would like to go over and um, reach out if that's okay. Do you have recommendations for those who maybe aren't currently working in healthcare? Perhaps um, they don't the have PPP an association is, with, right. go ahead. The PPE opportunities are always great, but I know right now with COVID-19, a lot of those are on hold because we're trying to get people at home and away from uh, the facilities and not bringing others into the facilities. Um, when those start again, um, work with whoever your preceptor is at your PPE site to try to get as many shadowing opportunities. I have students reach out to me and say, is there any way I could shadow an informatics person? We don't have that in our department, but I'm always willing to reach out to our informatics team and see if they have any availability to help a student shadow. Um, otherwise, volunteering at um, your local facility, um, some people have, you know, the, the volunteer programs or um, at your association, when we do have our face-to-face -face spring seminar, which we're tentatively renaming our September seminar this year, we still do want to hold it face-to-face. -face. You get an opportunity to reach out with different people at other organizations. And if you've always wanted to work for St. Vincent's or Baptist and you get a chance to meet a manager there, you know, don't be afraid to ask, hey, um, what kind of opportunities do you have that I could, you know, get my foot in the door at your facility to either volunteer or, like I said, look for those temporary um, opportunities. A lot of times temp jobs can turn into a full-time position. Yeah, that's an excellent point with the PPEs. And for those that may not be familiar with the acronym, that is a professional practice experience that is the, um, it's sort of the capstone. It's the final internship uh, that's a part of the HIT program. So thank you for that. We do have a current HIT um, program student who wants to know what would set her apart when applying for jobs after graduation? Well, of course, you want to highlight um, your your education, and hopefully, as soon as you're finishing up the education, you're also um, going for one of your credentials. You know, for example, the RHIT. Um, that will set you apart against someone that does not yet have that credential. And then, any relevant experience you have, even if you haven't had an official job or your job has been in, say, finance, it's not related to healthcare, but if you've done Excel spreadsheets and you have expertise in some of those um, advanced Excel, list that on your resume. I had one person who said um, she was a volunteer bookkeeper at her church and she used Excel, and I'm like, that counts. That's We, we need someone that knows Excel for the people that work on uh, projects for our spreadsheets. Um, if you volunteer for anything, whether it's in your community or within your local HIM association, include that, that you're a volunteer for this organization or you're um, a volunteer on a committee. A lot of times that's a great way for um, students to get on a committee and learn. And within a year or two, maybe they want to take a position as a committee chair once they learn what that committee does and how it works and start establishing themselves as a leader, getting their name out there again. Excellent advice. Thank you for that. Any other questions for Julia? Hey, Dr. Banta does have all of my contact information, um, so if you have questions, uh, she can send them to me at any time. I just hope everyone is out there staying healthy and safe, and then I'm sure after 
all of this COVID stuff passes, um, we are going to get back to seeing a lot more in-person networking, a lot of more on-site students that are doing their um, their PPE or their professional clinical rotations, and we'll get to interact a lot more and get to know. I, I expect more temporary positions should um, also open up after this period, because right now we do know all hospital facilities are having a decrease in clinic appointments, any kind of routine visits, elective surgeries, um, elective admissions. So after this passes and those ramp back up, there's going to be a lot of patients that have been putting off a surgery or that missed the routine visit and now they're trying to get in. So I think healthcare is going to pick back up um, and there's going to be a need to have some temporary workers to help um, manage the sudden influx of volume when that time comes. So hopefully within the next couple of months we'll start seeing everyone um, back and on site and busy and everyone's going to be able to take their certification exams at testing centers and continue uh, moving forward. Definitely. Well, Julia, thank you so much for being with us today. We uh, appreciate you taking the time to share your story. It, uh, it definitely adds value and um, was good for our students to hear. I've added my email address into the chat window. If you do want CEU credit for today's session, do reach out to me by email. Um, also want to put a plug in and just let you know that we are currently accepting applications for the HIT program at SJR State. Uh, the application period is open until June 15th uh, for fall enrollment. So uh, reach out as well if you have any questions. Thank you for being here and have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Thank you. Mm -hmm.